One and a half years ago, uh, two of these gentlemen were on the stage to talk about HDR technology, mainly from the camera technology per perspective. It was uh, Giesbert Hochgürtel, Product Manager, Professional Solutions Europe at Sony, and Klaus Weber, Senior Product Marketing Manager, Camera at Grass Valley. Today, we would like to discuss the complete workflow. Therefore, we have invited John Carter, Senior Product Manager, Snell Advanced Media. Sam doesn't produce cameras or displays, which are the two ends of the HDR chain, but they have products for everything in between. And last but not least, we have uh, Kevin Salvage on the stage, European Regional Development Manager Europe at Leader Instruments. We try to clarify how to evaluate HDR signals. So please welcome the gentleman. Go ahead. Thank you very much. So I thought we'd start with a simple question, or maybe not so simple. Um, why HDR and why now? Who wants to start with that one? <laughs> Okay, I, maybe I take this one because it's an easy question, I think. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I think why HDR is, is quite obvious. I think everybody who has seen HDR in, uh, produced in a good way and presented in a good way will agree that it, it really adds a lot of quality to the picture. And the really good thing on of HDR is that it does not require a lot of extra bandwidth, a lot of extra data. So it's, it's really improving the performance a lot for the viewers without requiring a, a lot of, let's say, at least additional bandwidth. It has, of course, certain complexity in production. That's the reason why we have the panel today to discuss these challenges. But it gives a lot of benefits for a relatively yeah, moderate um, in ad additional investment. Uh, but in terms of the why now, though, aspect of it, why, why is there? Why are we seeing this particular okay. momentum around it now? Okay. Yeah. Why now? I think it's we are now in a phase of of changes. So we had, um, for as we all know, for many many years SD. Now we had for some like ten years, fifteen years, depending on the country, uh, we had HD. And um, as we see now, the consumer market has already uh, went one step further to 4K televisions and now HDR capable televisions. So the market is prepared for another step. And uh, HDR is um, available now, um, also from the production side. Uh, we, we have still some missing links in the production chain, which are really closing um, in the next couple of months, I would say. So I think it's, it's really the right time to, uh, to look now into HDR and find ways how to best implement HDR in the workflows. Obviously, one of the greatest challenges is concurrent production in SDR and HDR. Um, Gisbert, I wondered if you might talk us through some of the challenges of doing that. Yes, yeah. Okay, yeah. okay. sorry. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I mean, uh, today we've, we uh, have the situation that most of the broadcasters, 99.9%, .9 still require a very good HD signal, ITU 709 color space and 2.4 gamma. And on the other hand, they want to uh, produce program in an enhanced format, in an, let's say, with improved quality, which is provided by ultra high definition on the one side, but that is only the resolution side, and on the other side in HDR. So producing in parallel means a double benefit for the customer and also for the producers, because then you can, you can satisfy both needs at the same time. And, and Klaus, does this mean that we should be producing source signals concurrently in native HDR and native SDR at the camera? Well, this is one of the options you have. So currently we support that. So we, we have a complete simultaneous workflow in our camera system. So producing native HDR, native SDR at the same time and still giving you the flexibility to control the two different signals uh, separate from each other. But uh, on the other hand, to have a complete simultaneous workflow requests also um, a double amount of resources in your production, in, in your switcher, in your servers, and so on. So we 
don't think that will be a workflow very well accepted uh, on the longer term. That's good for an initial phase to learn more about it, to play with it, to uh, you know, to f a first start. But I think uh, to become a real success, we have to have a workflow which combine both productions um, in in one um, yeah one workflow rather than have two parallel workflows. Obviously, there is also the option to convert at the end of the chain. What what are the factors against doing that? Hmm. So we we are working on exactly that. Yep. So we, we we have shown at NAB a first prototype of a so-called HDR SDR down mapper, which takes the native HDR input and it could be HLG or PQ, whatever has been uh, selected by the, uh, the client. And at the output, you can down map that one into a really good quality SDR, so for the use of today. And of course, this uh, uh, down mapping includes change of color space uh, um, and a selection of the different curves and also to add on some, let's say, artistical intent. Uh, so you can select different, we call it lookup tables in the down mapper, so to generate a certain look you like. Kevin, can you give us a bit of information about how uh, picture quality is affected by these two different approaches? Well, I think the, the challenge, as Gareth kind of outlined there, is ideally productions would like to have one single workflow, 4K, wide colour gamut, HDR. Mm. But as we've also identified at the moment, the clients are paying for HD 709 SDR. That's what they're paying for. So they don't want to compromise what they're delivering while they experiment with the new flavours. So that's why we're kind of seeing them in parallel. Now, at Leader, we're trying to provide tools that will cover it on both ways. So you can have the simultaneous workflows of HDR and SDR, and the way our 4K waveform monitor works, you can switch between one input, which is HDR, one input that's SDR, so you can very quickly you know, make sure that you're delivering the quality that expected to both, then, if you then move forward to the next step where you combine and have that single production chain of 4K wide color gamut HDR, you're still got the tools with the waveform, you can set up the cursors so that you can rack the cameras as you would do in an SDR world because we've got a huge amount of experience. We know how to set cameras up in an SDR environment, but then we're aware we've got the overheads and the low lights that come with the HDR piece. So we're providing a tool that will cover both options and make sure you're delivering the optimum product to the customer. So basically they have no reason not to pay you because that's what we're here for. Yeah, I mean, one thing I'd, I'd just add to the, to the conversion side and what HDR does for us actually makes us uh, or gives us the opportunity to look at things a little bit different rather than just a simple crude conversion at the end of a, a workflow. So we, we discussed about two streams, two sets of production facilities, people, etc. What we're trying to do with the SAM concept is actually amalgamate the two, where we understand there are different feeds going all around the world today, just in HD. Um, by times that by two for the UHD, it doesn't work for two workflows. So the way we look at it is on the front end of, a, of, the, of the vision mixer or the switcher product, which is the area that I specialize in. What we want to do there is actually allow one set of graphics, one set of replays to be mixed against the two outputs, either from a base station or the BPU as an example. So in terms of that workflow there, we do have still the vision supervisor or the master shader or whatever terminology you're used to, uh, calling the shots with a set of rack cameras. So far, a lot of the tests we've done is the guys are still working in the SDR space, but still have the latitude on the HDR path to actually enhance the, uh, you know, the performance that you want out of the HDR. And again, a lot of it's not a simple engineering set of parameters that go through a lookup, you know, a, a brute force and ignorant lookup table, but there are creative decisions. So when a color, uh, sorry, when a shader will do a football match at night, the light's very level, they will pick on the grass as an example and make sure everything has that datum point. When it's downhill skiing, well, obviously the snow comes about, okay? So there's, there's latitude that has to be controlled in real time effectively for both those paths. So it's more than for, for, for a lot of the concepts, it's just not a straightforward um, standards conversion type mindset. There's actually a level of create, creatability in there. And again, you want to get the best images out of the cameras um, for, you know, for, the, for the long term record and quality on the shelf now. Yeah. 
Uh, Gisbert, how do we uh, effectively monitor SDR and HDR during the process of signal creation? How do, what are the things we need to do to make sure that happens effectively? Sorry, I, I could not understand. I'm, I'm saying in terms, of, in terms of monitoring SDR and HDR yeah. during signal creation, what steps do we need to take to make sure that's done effectively? Well, you can, uh, in, if, you want, if you want to monitor it, you can, you can have one HDR monitor for the producer to check the HDR picture, but you don't need for each shader a specific HDR monitor. You can do it with an SDR monitor because in our uh, lineup there is an SDR minus gain function so that you can tune your SDR signal down to a level which gives a perfect SDR and a perfect HDR picture. So you can adjust the shading, that means the iris and the master pedestal, to the SDR picture, which gives, let's say, a very good signal to HDR and SDR. So you can do both at the same time. That's the technology behind it. Does anyone else want to come in on that question? I think the interesting bit you mentioned there, and you'll hear this word artistic intent, mm -hmm that doing any conversion from SDR to HDR, we're engineers, we can have codes that will do these very smart algorithms and will move points to point. What you're looking at here is something that an algorithm can't say, well, the picture looks warm, the picture looks cold. It, you know, there is artistic intent mm. in that original picture and that then needs to be mirrored in the conversion. And I think that's why at the moment, the productions we've sort of been involved in, we've seen the two chains running because they want to keep that artistic intent in both the HDR and the SDR. Mm. And at the moment, they don't quite have that confidence that it will automatically be created in the other one. Can, can you tell us about a project where you feel it has been particularly successful? Well, as I said, we've, we've been involved in numerous ones. And I would say at the moment, we're still all exploring and trying to understand... Um, the majority of them have been the two streams, purely yeah. because they can't jeopardise the HDR, the one that they're being paid for. Mm. Um, at the moment, most of the people we've looked at and spoken to broadcast-wise, it's been hybrid log gamma. Yeah. has been the method that's been used for the HDR piece. I think that's because at the moment, they're concerned about the creation of the metadata that will go with, the other, with PQ. But I think as they get confident and they know that the HDR piece is working and the SDR is naturally falling out of it, then they'll look to enhance again mm. and start to add the value and then maybe we'll see PQ come more to the fore. But I think you'll see hybrid log gamma probably start as the first toe in the water for this as a production tool. I mean, I mean I'll support Kevin what he's saying there, you know. We are in early days of this, and our, you know, our customers and the facilities that, that effectively are covering sport, right, in, in UHD, are trying to work out the workflows, you know, at, at a base level. Um, so they're, number one, the rights holder gets to say that the content doesn't, doesn't change. It's got to be shot and delivered in that native format. And then secondly, we're actually bolting away around that, the, the efficiencies of a workflow, okay? Uh, obviously, all this has implications for budgets, for investment, hardware, software, and resources and skills as well. Um, so, what kind of advice are you offering to broadcasters at the moment, in, who are, you know, obviously looking to make this this transition? That's a question for anyone. Well, from a leader perspective, the HDR piece in our product is a software license. Yep. We know today that not everybody's going to want to do it, but they've probably got it somewhere in the back of their mind. So therefore, a product that is purely a license to upgrade to support, whether that be S-Log3, PQ, or hybrid log gamma, that's kind of our approach to it. So it's done at the pace of the customer or the customer's client, not having to buy, buy it today and it's sitting on the shelf and getting no revenue from it. Yeah. In all our 4K products from, uh, for live production, HDR is implemented as a standard. But our approach is that we have the hybrid, uh, the uh, S-Log3 gamma curve installed because that gives the widest dynamic range in combination with our sensors. And the idea is that we produce it in the, what, what shall I say, a, a, a picture with the widest dynamic range and then in the end transfer it to the curve 
which is uh, requested by the customer and uh, specified by ITU, for instance, be it PQ or the HLG hybrid log gamma curve. That is Great. our approach, but it is a standard to all our 4K cameras now. Okay, that's a point we have a slightly different point of view uh, on. The thing is, you cannot, let's say, or take it the other way around. We have, in case of HDR now, a much, much larger contrast we want to cover, or we, we need to cover. And we don't have more bits available, which you ideally, ideally would have. So if we could go to 14-bit or 16-bit, then we would not have a problem. Unfortunately, we cannot, because all the studio infrastructure are limited 10-bit nowadays. So we have to look now how to map this additional signal into the given uh, bit depths available. And so if you, you make your choice that your final output should be PQ or HLG, it doesn't matter, we believe the best is to map your available uh, or the contrast range you want to cover in the native way into it, to that given bit depths. Mm -hmm. And what's the difference in making that natively rather than use an in-between curve is inside the camera system, we have a much, much larger bit depths available. Of course, you have from your A to D conversion, from your images, some like 14, 16 bit or more. You have for the internal calculation to generate the curve you want, you have some like 34 bits of precision. The bottleneck is really the 10 bits uh, interface. And therefore, we believe you should do everything inside uh, the camera system to generate the curve in the most optimum way. Then you can even modify the curve, like adding black stretch or similar things in the 34 bit domain and generate a 10 bit signal. Uh, at the output where, where necessary. And that is, on, on our belief, the best way to do it. And we offer the flexibility to choose any curve which is used in the market, which is PQ and uh, HLG. And even you can choose between a limited bit um, or code value range or full code value range. So we give all the flexibility. And our approach is to ask the people find out by themselves what is the best way to do it, do some tests, learn by themselves uh, using the today's parallel workflow to, to, to get a better understanding what limitations are there and then make the right decision at the time when it is required to make a decision. So yeah. that is also, we have the uh, recommendation to use the S-Log3 gamma curve, but in all our products we also have the hybrid log gamma curve included. So it's a customer choice what he wants to do. And our approach is to say, as uh, Klaus pointed out, we have 34 bits in the camera, so a wide, very wide uh, range available. So we believe that if we go, if we go there with the S-Log3 gamma curve, we can then later on make a perfect HLG or PQ conversion. Uh, so I was just, just going to add to that because I have to sit in between different camera manufacturers with the front end of the mix of products. <laughs> yeah. So, so the, what, what we do is we basically have extended our format fusion technology. So we'll be shortly releasing format fusion four, and that's basically built on we first started the ability to bring SD and HD together. What the new version of format fusion four does is has a HDR layer to that. So on any input to the switcher, it can be S log three, it can be HLG, it can be PQ. We don't, you know, we, we, we've got to be friends to everybody in the middle. And then on the output side, we have a separate group of uh, the Format Fusion 4. And then we allocate to our outputs what, uh, what the customers may need, you know, in parallel uh, SDR, HDR, HLG, 2020 color spaces and 709 color spaces. So we give you all the handles on the front end, mix them together, and then on the output drive. And one of the nice things that we've done with the switcher is because it's transparent in the workflow, so we don't have to worry about telling OB companies that they've got to start declaring extra rack spaces uh, for, for extra processing. So it's all within the same time boundaries as well within the same allocated space. So when I was talking earlier about it gives us a chance to redefine crude conversion, what we're trying to do is put the conversion element at a high standard in the right parts of the signal flow that keeps a dual process uh, efficient and cost effective. Uh, can I just ask, is it, is it sports that's driving this transition, or is it other types of content in general? Well, for, for us, what we're seeing is totally yeah. sports, right? Yes, yeah, totally sports. Totally sports. Um, what I would say is we're very close to a lot of sports action because of the UHD take-up and, 
and the amount of kahunas that come into new, new uh, trucks, you know, especially in the UK with the EPL. So we're getting involved at the early stages there. You know, going back to the question, why H HRD? I typically look at my 13-year-old son at home, and if he's not playing games, he's watching people play games in full, um, you know, high-definition uh, HDR uh, formats. Then he looks at a football match on the telly, and he says, it looks a bit flat, Dad. I'll go back to the game. And I think that's one of the key points that we've got to understand as, as in the broadcast game. I mean, you agree with me, right? Yeah? <laughs> Anyone who's got a teenager son, they know what I'm talking about. Um, but this is part of our industry competing at that next level because the generations coming through are looking at Netflix with pre-graded uh, content. They're watching games. They've got big, powerful gaming machines. And what we've got to do is keep you know, our, our livelihoods moving forward by offering good pictures and good content when it's the World Cup final or whatever that might be. Uh, Kevin, you sort of alluded to the fact, obviously, it does have creative implications as well. And I guess HDR for drama will be particularly, uh, particularly marked change. Well, I'll say that the first production we were involved with um, was for Amazon. It was the Grand Tour. Yeah. Um, where a number of our units were used by United Media on the production as they did this global tour with the with the program then obviously it had to be post-produced again they use pq because of the luxury that it could be post-produced it was graded post-produced then was delivered to a company in burbank for acceptance by amazon so you've got that piece yes drama and that will i think pick up on this very quickly the interesting bit's going to be for the consumer at home that they're watching their netflix their amazon program looks stunning they suddenly switch over to watch Premier League football and if it's not HDR or they're going to watch the drama on their main you know terrestrial channel and it's not they're going to go like you just said with your children it looks flat it looks lifeless against what I was watching on the other one so I think it will get dragged through high-end drama will be the first to go I'm sure of it because of its association following film techniques um, the cameras are already out there people like Harry, Sony, Canon, Red, these cameras have a fantastic dynamic range. So that will pull through and then as we know it ripples down to you know your, your 36 episodes of Homes Under the Hammer are being done in HDR. <laughs> um, obviously in terms of the example you, you mentioned there, uh, the Grand Tour, was that deemed to have been a success or were important lessons learned during that production? I mean, it was Amazon's biggest... In terms of HDR, obviously. Yeah, I mean, it was, it was one of the major features mm. that they had. Obviously, it was UHD as well. Mm. Um, it had, I think, the most number of streams for a debut programme. It's now currently filming its second series. Um, I mean, the silly numbers about what it cost for some of the productions and that. But I sort of meant creatively. Was it felt to have been an asset? or Having seen the pictures, their cars on tracks... For petrol heads, it just looks absolutely stunning, you know. And they did go to the level of actually getting some of the feature film producers in to do some of the pieces. So they did become like mini feature films. So they had a look and feel. If anybody's seen the program, you can probably pick out who's produced and directed certain car shots and stuff like that and the themes around them because they've done it in a certain way. So it's allowed them to really lift and raise that product. I'd just like to close out by asking each of you in turn um, what's the latest from your company in terms of support for HDR. Klaus? Sorry, I, I didn't uh, understand your audio was pretty bad here. On yeah, I'm just, uh, just asking you um, in, just in turn to go through what's your latest solution with support for HDR, what, what you're doing at the moment around HDR. I have to apologise, oh. but uh, I, 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 have I didn't problem. understand it again. Okay. Uh, sorry. What's, the, what's your latest solution at the moment in terms of HDR, uh, the latest support you're offering within your product range? The licence support of... Latest, latest. latest well, okay, latest, yeah. sorry. Um, <laughs> as I said, the sound here on, on stage is very bad. I, I hope you have a better reception than <laughs> I have it here, sorry. Yeah. So in, in all our latest uh, camera products, um, we support HDR as a license. So it's, it's built in uh, hardware-wise, it's all prepared and it's available through a license. 
In other products, it's slightly different because in a switcher, you don't need a separate license. It's, it's more um, a little different in, in, in setting a, a certain things that's already part of the switcher software, not a separate license. So what is still missing is the, uh, the piece of the HDR, SDR up and down mapping, which will be uh, in the first uh, stage a separate card and which will be implemented over the time in most of our products in the input or the output cards uh, in switcher servers or wherever it's relevant. John? Yeah, so we're, we're good to go today. Uh, the format Fusion Fu uh, 4 is the license that you basically bring to the Kahuna platform. Good news is anybody who has a Kahuna today, it's a 9600 sort of level of product, they can buy the license. Uh, and they are HDR ready regardless if they're in a HD truck or a UHD truck. So we're good to go. So as I mentioned earlier, Leader from the outset has supported S-Log3, PQ, Hybrid Log Gamma. Prior to NAB, they were the preserves of our 4K products. Um, at NAB, we announced support on our portable LV5333 HD waveform monitor for HDR. I've just put HD and HDR together, which I know we haven't touched on at all. But the piece, this unit also supports two sample interleaves, so one leg of a 4K signal, full frame image, you can monitor it, you've got the confidence that it's up and racked correctly. So we will continue to support all of the flavours, the ability to adjust and set the reference levels. The standards talk about it, some of them are best practice. We give you the tools to actually set them, so rather than having them hard and fast, so we will just continue to um, follow what the standards tell us you guys need to make the programs that you do. And finally, as I said before, our, our, all our 4K system cameras support HDR as a standard feature. And we also have a new product shown on uh, NAB. It was the HDR C4000. It's a converter which has two independent, independent channels. And you can uh, convert from one resolution into the other, from one frame rate into the other, from one color space into the other, and also from one gamma curve into the other. So that is a really multifunctional uh, converter which uh, can do any conversion from any standard to any standard and artistic intended rendering. That means if you, for instance, transfer from hybrid log gamma to PQ or to S log 3, you can also then do a fine tuning of the signal in terms of color metry, for instance. Okay, well, I think we're out of time, are we? Or no. Uh, thank you very much, gentlemen. Uh, are there any questions from the audience? No, oh, perfect. <laughs> all, all questions answered. So, um, yeah, once again, thank you very much for taking part in the discussion. And, uh, yeah, thank you and have a nice day. Thank, thank you. you. Goodbye. Thank you very much. <laughs>